pray. Amen. You can go ahead and grab a seat. My name is Robert Smith. I am the high school pastor here at Calvary. I'm excited to be here with you. Um, If you, as you're getting settled in, grab a Bible, open up to the book of Romans. Yes, we're still in Romans. I think if my memory serves me correct, this is week 29 in Romans. So we got one more week after this. So if you're kind of like done in Romans, the, the end is near. If you're enjoying it, sorry, it's coming to a close. All good things have to come to an end. But hey, we're, we've enjoyed going through the book of Romans. Hope you have as well. So Romans 15 is where we're at. If you don't have a Bible with you, we'd love for you to grab one of the Bibles in the chair in front of you. It's page 949. Uh, and as always, if you don't have a Bible at home, please feel free to take one of those with you so that you have a Bible you can read and study at home. So as we get in, I got a a question for us. Question as we get started. How many of you, by show of hands, have ever imitated or copied someone else? Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of humorous. Right? This is literally every single one of us at some point, and and it may have been a while ago. It may have been earlier this week. It may have been on the way here as you were mocking a family member or spouse or someone in the car. That's between you guys. You can you can sort that out later. But but see, it's interesting that, that idea of imitation. And this is my life right now. I've got a three year old son named Eli um, who literally copies everything, whether I like it or not. And some things it's like really cute because it's like oh. He learned how to put on his shoes by himself from watching us. And then as I'm taking him to preschool uh, earlier this week, I'm like clearing my throat because the the weather changes, have my allergies all messed up. And as I'm walking, I hear this tiny little velociraptor next to me. And I'm like, what in the world? And it dawned on me, he's just doing what I was doing. So it's that reality that, that... these little humans that are in our life copy everything that we do. Uh, And what's really interesting is that idea of imitation, it changes, our our perception of it changes based on the the life stage that we're looking at. Like with toddlers, like I mentioned, it's cute, except for when they copy our bad habits better than us. Um, And they grow up a little bit and and they hit that elementary age and, and they're still copying a lot of things, but this time it's with words. And they come home with that statement or joke or saying that they heard at school and they say it about 14 billion times in about a half an hour. And you're just like, oh, or, or if it's not that, it's that song, like the, the title song or the statement from their favorite movie or TV show that just goes on repeat for like three weeks straight until you feel like you're gonna reach a breaking point and they find a new show and you're like, thank you, Jesus. Um, and, and you're like, if you could copy a little bit less, that would be great. And then there's the teenage years where parents freak out and they're like, don't copy anything. Don't copy what you see on TV. Don't copy what you see on social media. Especially don't copy what we did when we were teenagers. Don't copy what your friends are doing. Don't copy anything. Just go in a hole and stay there until you're an adult. <laughs> and then you become an adult and they say, hey, you know what's really helpful if you get mentors and coaches that you can look to as an example, and you can imitate what they're doing. And they say, if you're in business, what do you need to do? You need to find best practices, which is what? Imitating other people's business practices that are successful so you can be successful. And, it, and it's all great, and, and you continue to get older, and they're like, hey, imitate people, except don't imitate your younger self or imitate teenagers, uh, like I tried to do this week and played a, a game with youth group and came away with some injuries. Like, and the older you get, the less you're able to imitate your younger self. And all this really comes with a core of, of we understand that in life there's good examples that we follow and there's bad examples we follow. And if you're a parent, a part of our job as parents is saying, hey, kids, here's the examples you follow, here's the ones you don't. But in life, those are decisions we make as well. And as we look at Romans chapter 15 today, what Paul's gonna be doing is saying, hey, I'm gonna give you guys an example. I wanna, I wanna show you guys something that you should imitate and a pattern that you should follow your life after. And he's gonna contrast that with some things that we might wanna do and say, no, this is the pattern that we need to be living our life in. So Romans chapter 15, let's take a look at this together as, as we go through it. Romans 15, starting in verse one, says this. It says, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scripture, we might have hope. 
May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles, I will sing to your name. And it is said, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, let all the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will come, and he who arises to rule the Gentiles, in him will the Gentiles hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. If you're here last week, you recognize some common themes in what Paul is talking about here, because this, in many ways, is a continuation of chapter 14. Is Paul is saying, "Hey, how do we deal with people? How do we deal with people that are different than us?" Last week, we, we heard a message: "How do we deal with the people that, that we disagree with, that, that live life differently than us?" And, and Paul is going to be continuing that idea here, and is really saying, "Hey, let me finish up this thought from a different perspective." Instead of just saying, hey, here's what to do, here's why to do it, you know, from chapter 14, he's saying, let's take a look at an example. Let's take a look at the example of Jesus and what he can, can demonstrate on how we live life with other people. How do we live life with people that are different than us is really what he's saying. And, and, and what he's going to demonstrate here is that Jesus' example is a lifestyle of serving. And it's really Paul's big idea in, in this first section, that, that Jesus' example is a lifestyle of serving, not just a, a moment or an event, but a lifestyle. And he makes this statement when he opens it up that, that Jesus didn't come to please himself, but he came to build up other people. He came, he came to serve as a, a core part of who he was and what his purpose for being here is. And, and what's important about this is who Jesus served. Because if we're honest, it's easy to serve our friends. It's easy to take that phone call from our best friend that, that needs us to drop everything and go do something. It's a little harder when it's from that person that we've had some tension with in the past or that family member that we go, I'll just screen this call and send them to voicemail. But Jesus, his, his lifestyle of service, it wasn't selective to just being the people that he liked. In fact, what's interesting is when you read through the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there's actually very few instances where Jesus served his disciples, where Jesus directly served the people he was relationally close with. But you see over and over and over again is Jesus serving people that were kind of on the outside, people that, that especially were the outcasts, people that were unpopular, people that were considered hopeless, people that were unacceptable culturally. And this caused a great deal of tension with Jesus and the religious leaders. Because the religious leaders wanted Jesus just to hang out with the good people, wanted him to have kind of that, that core group of people just surround, hey, just, just hang out with us religious folks. And Jesus continually would drift over and, and spend time with the sinners. In fact, in, in Matthew 11, it's really interesting that the religious leaders are, are kind of having this conversation and they label Jesus. They, they kind of make this name for him, and they call him a friend of sinners. And for us, we're like, yes, Jesus is a friend of sinners. Jesus is my homeboy. And, and, and that's how, how we may hear that. But in that day, that was an incredibly derogatory, incredibly judgmental statement. They're being incredibly critical to Jesus, questioning his judgment, his character, who he associated with, how he spent his time, how he built his relationships. But Jesus did that for a reason. He did that to, to demonstrate that he wasn't selective on who he would serve. In fact, he served everyone. Paul points this out with a, with a very intentional reason. He says that, that Jesus came to serve and took the reproaches of all of us on himself. See, the reason Jesus spent his whole life serving is because he knew that the end of his life would be the culmination of that. The, at the end, he knew he would take the, the reproach, the, the accusations, the judgment, the, the condemnation, the guilt of the sin of the entire world on himself on the cross. And he knew that that would be the culmination. The purpose of his life was to bear out the sin of the whole world on the cross. My sin, your sin, the world's sin, past, present, future, paid for by Jesus on the cross. 
And Paul's saying, this is how we know Jesus serves people. Because look at what he did for us on the cross. But there's, there's something else that Paul's, Paul's getting at here with this idea of service and, and a kind of an underlying tension that he's wanting to address. And, and you can kind of feel it as you're reading through it. He's talking about Jesus' example. He's talking about, hey, here's how we're to, to live. Here's what we're to do. And then it seems to kind of take a left turn. And he starts talking about like Jews and Gentiles and all of this. And it's kind of like, what, what's he talking about here? And, and he brings us up to show just how far reaching Jesus' love and service to people was. Because he's pointing out that, that Jesus came to serve both the, the Jews and the Gentiles. And this is important because there is an incredibly deep divide between these two groups of people that goes back for generations. Because see, what happened was in the Old Testament, God established his covenant with the, the people of Israel. The nation of Israel, he established it. You are my chosen nation. Salvation will come through this covenant. And basically, God said, hey, if you want to be saved, you will be a part of this covenant. You will follow the law. You will follow the, the commandments and guidelines that I've given you. You'll be circumcised, and this will be your sign that you are in this covenant. And, and that's how you find salvation. And so for, for generations, the, the Jews thought the way you get saved is by becoming a, a citizen of Israel and following these religious customs. And then Jesus comes along and just kind of takes their box and shakes it up and goes, let's do something new. Because Jesus came and established a new covenant. And this is incredibly significant to these people in that day. And we, we remember this last week, we took communion together as a church. And every time we take communion, we, we remember the words of Jesus there in the upper room the night he was betrayed. And we say, you know, he took the, the bread and broke it and said, this is my body which is broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. And that next line, we might skip over it if we're not paying attention. He takes the cup and he says, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Drink this in remembrance of me. To them, they're, they're sitting there and they're like, wait, new covenant? What's this? What's this mean? How does this work? See, Jesus came to establish a new covenant. This wasn't a national covenant. It wasn't a covenant with the nation of Israel. This is a global covenant. Salvation, us getting to God, didn't happen by becoming a citizen of a nation and following a set of guidelines and, and things like that. Salvation now comes from becoming a citizen of God's kingdom by joining his family and following Jesus. And Paul's using this to say, hey guys, Gentiles, Jews, you guys have these disagreements. You don't wanna welcome each other. You don't wanna love each other. You don't wanna serve each other because you're different because you got these backgrounds. He's saying, Jesus came to serve both of you guys. Jesus loved both of you guys. Love and serve each other. And this is where it meets the road for us, that this is where it applies to us and that we have a different kind of people. It's not that we're Jews and there's Gentiles. It's, it's that we have people that we have differences with. But Jesus came to love us and love them. Jesus served them and served us. So the, the question is, are we going to follow Jesus' example? Are we going to imitate Christ in this act of serving and loving people, even those that are different than us, to the people that are unlike us? Because this goes back to the issue last week of, are we going to live in harmony and unity and love with other people? Because Paul opens this statement or, or this, this passage with a statement, he says, we have an obligation to, to bear with one another, to build each other up. He's saying, if you are a follower of Jesus, you no longer have the option of living for yourself only. You no longer have the option of living a life that's full of selfishness and focused simply on yourself. He said, following Jesus now points you to serve God and to serve other people. And so let me, let me challenge you with a little bit of an evaluation tonight. What, what's driving your life? What's the, the underlying purpose of why you wake up, why you do everything you do each day? Is it simply to build up your area of the world, build up your life, your portfolio, your reputation, your name? Or is it existing to build up other people, to glorify God and to serve others while also doing your responsibilities? And with that, how well are you serving? Jesus, the, the model here that Paul describes is one where our life is focused on serving others. See, we can't really follow Jesus and represent him well unless we're serving people. 
because that's such at the core of who Jesus is and what he did. And, and so how are you serving? And if, if you're like, I'm not really sure where to get started with this, let me give you some, some kind of on-ramps here. If, if you are, are new to Calvary, maybe just new to serving, haven't done anything, uh, you heard Pastor Ted mention Main Street. We'd love for you to join us on Main Street. Hand out candy or, or water bottles, run a game, and, and just talk with kids and family as we bless our community. And, and maybe that's the on-ramp. Maybe just a single event, try it out once, and kind of start that ball rolling. Or maybe you're here and you've done some of the service stuff. Maybe you did serve our schools. You've done Main Street for a few years. Maybe that next step is for you to start serving on a, a regular weekly basis. Maybe you, you say, hey, I'm passionate about this area. Uh, I'm passionate about this type of ministry. I want to get plugged in to serve. Um, we've got an opportunity for, for children's ministry. If you like children, there's an opportunity for you. Our, our children's director is going to be outside uh, with some information um, with how you can get plugged in serving in our kids' ministry. So um, you can stop by out there, talk to her. Her name's Heidi. You can say, hey, tell me about what the options for serving and, and what that looks like, what I would need to do, what that commitment is, and she'd love to, to help get you in, involved there. If you don't like kids, just walk by. Um, but maybe there's another area. Maybe there's somewhere else you can get plugged in and serving. Outside the church, how can you be serving uh, on a daily basis with your life? How can you be serving your family? What are the ways that you can use your life to serve your spouse or serve your kids to better reflect Jesus in your household? What are the ways you could serve your boss or your coworkers? Not to get a promotion or recognition, not to get a, a plaque on the wall with your name on it, but to better represent Jesus in that context. What are the ways we could serve our city together? Maybe it's you volunteering at your kid or grandkid's school uh, and taking care of a need they have. Maybe it's you coaching a sports team or starting a club or, or doing something to help this community with something they don't have. How can you be serving with your life? Because Jesus modeled that for us and he's calling us to follow after him. And, and really, as we, as we transition now, I wanna get kind of practical on what this looks like. Because what Paul's really getting at here is where our character is and whether or not our character, who we are as a person, aligns with who Jesus is and who he's calling us to be. And, and so I want to take a, a few minutes now to just say, hey, how do we build godly character? What's it look like to grow godly character? And as we do this, I'm going to give you a little warning. These are not going to be like some earth-shattering new idea that you've never heard before. You're not going to walk out of here being like, man, you'll never hear, you'll never understand what I heard at church. I've never heard this before. I'm not going to get any book deals on these three steps. We'll just put it that way. <laughs> but what's interesting is scripture has this way of repeating the important things, the things we need to hear, the things we need to, to live out in our life. Because God knows we need repetition in order to hear it. We need that, that regularity in order for it to soak into our life. And so Paul's going to mention three things that, that we need to do here to grow godly character. And we're going to walk through and, and see what that looks like for us. And the first step, if we want to grow godly characters, we need to look to the Bible. Told you it wouldn't be surprising. We need to look to the Bible, though. Check out what he says, verse 4. Verse four, he says this. He says, for whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of scriptures, we may have hope. He's saying this. He's saying, as we look to Jesus for an example here, we've got, we've got instructions. We've got a guide. We've got, we've got a path that's laid out for us, and that's the Bible. See, Second Timothy 3.16 says, for uh, that, that all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and training in righteousness. And, and so the Bible here acts as an instruction for our life. The Bible teaches us what to believe and how to live. If we want to get to know God, we do that through getting to know the Bible. So we need to look to the Bible because it, it gives us instruction. Secondly, because it brings encouragement in our life. We all, if we're honest, have moments where we need encouragement. We have those moments, those, those situations where we just need a little encouragement to get through what we're dealing with. And the Bible is full of nuggets of encouragement of, of God saying, hey, I love you. I'm here for you. I'm going to help you through this. Let me show you how. As well, the Bible is full of stories of people just like us that, that struggle and have situations and troubles 
And it's full of stories on how God redeems and how God rescues and how God helps. And so if you need encouragement tonight, look to the Bible. If you're not sure where, we've got a a 50-day Bible reading challenge, or if you count like Pastor Chad, it's 49 days. Um, If you were here when he confessed that uh, counting mishap, but uh, join us in that. I think we still have some of the the brochures out at the the Connection Centers. You can go on our social media and and find the, the Bible plan there. Or another great place to go, if you don't know where to read, is to read the Psalms. The Psalms are incredibly honest and transparent about the struggles of life and how God helps us. But look to the Bible, it gives us instruction, it gives us encouragement, and finally it produces hope. And that might seem a little repetitive with the encouragement side, but encouragement's kind of that that daily, kind of weekly boost. But as we get to know God through getting to know the Bible, we get something bigger than that. We get the hope that pushes us through long term. We get the hope saying, hey, I can... I can persevere for this next month, this next year, because I know God loves me. I know God is for me. I know God's with me. So if you want to grow godly character, look to the Bible. Secondly, as Paul outlines here, the second step we need to do is we need to practice endurance. See, as Paul continues, he's, uh, in, in verse 5, he says, hey, May the God of endurance grant to you to live in harmony with one another. And he starts a little kind of prayer, which we'll touch on in a minute. But that phrase just stood out to me, may the God of endurance. Throughout scriptures, all kinds of different statements, titles, descriptors of God. The God of endurance is not the most glamorous. You're the God that stuck around the longest. It's just, it's not something that really resonates. It's not something you see a whole lot. You know, you see uh, the God of love, the God of joy, the God of of peace, uh, the God of understanding. Those are the types of things that you see quite a bit. In fact, if Paul was thinking here, the God of peace would actually make more sense. May the God of peace grant you to live in harmony and peace with uh, one another. Which begs the question, why on earth would Paul say, may the God of endurance help you do this? I think it's because Paul knew better than than anyone in that moment, that if we're gonna live a life that glorifies God, that points people to him, if we're gonna live a life that's full of godly character, it's going to require endurance. There's gonna be moments that are hard, there's gonna be moments where we wanna give up, but we need to use God's strength to have endurance through that. And Paul is writing the book of Romans uh, in what's called his third missionary journey. After Paul came to know Jesus, after a little while, he started on these missionary journeys. He, he did ministry around Jerusalem, and then he started to take it out. And, and through Paul's experience, he knew the need for endurance in following Jesus. Because see, on his first missionary journey, he goes out and he's traveling, and he's taken the, the good news of Jesus to places that hadn't heard it yet, and people are just excited and hugging him, and no, not at all. They're, they're, they're literally running him out of cities. They're, they're telling him to leave and never come back. One city hated him so much and was so opposed to the message of Christ that they take him outside the city walls, they throw him down on the ground, and they start stoning him, which is where they're, they're literally executing him, formally executing him by throwing rocks as big as they can on top of him. The, the book of Acts says they leave him for dead and head back into the city. It says Paul wakes up the next morning happy to be alive, gets up, walks back in the city, and starts preaching again. Now, confession, if, if I do terrible in the next 10 minutes or so of this message, and you guys drag me out back and like execute me via stoning, and I happen to wake up tomorrow morning, I'm going somewhere, but I'm not coming back in here to preach again. <laughs> but Paul is like, no, this message is too important. I'm continuing. He, he concludes that missionary journey, second missionary journey. He's, he's traveling with, with some other people. They go into a city and they find a woman who's demon possessed. They cast the demon out. The, the woman's incredibly thankful. God's changed her life. The rest of the city now is an enemy of Paul because that woman brought value and, and money. She was a commodity because of what this demon was doing. They arrest Paul, they send him in jail, him and his company. Paul's worshiping Jesus in jail, they're singing. There's a miraculous jailbreak, Paul leaves, he goes to another city, starts preaching there. That city should be like, hey, this guy's pretty cool, right? Nope, runs him out of the city as well. 
So now he's on his third missionary journey, and, and he's writing the book of, of Romans, and he's writing to this church in Rome. He's never been there, and uh, in fact, if you keep reading in chapter 15, he's going to talk about how he wants to go visit Rome. He wants to see this church and meet them and see what God's doing, and he's like, hey, I'm going to see you guys, and I'm going to go up to Spain, and I'm going to take the good news up there, and this is what I'm going to do. In less than a year after he finishes this book, that started to happen, but not exactly how he planned. See, Paul would be arrested and start a three-year imprisonment process full of moves and transfers and interrogations and trials and beatings. They would eventually end with him being in Rome, but it was him standing before a Roman governor on trial. See, Paul knew that following Jesus requires endurance. He knew that there's moments where we just want to throw in the towel. We we just want to say, forget it. I'm done. I don't want to do this. This is hard. But he also knew that the reward of following Jesus is worth it. The the reward of serving Jesus and living for him far outweighs anything we could accomplish on our own in this life. And he says, hey, the God of endurance will help you through this. God will give you the strength through those difficult times to continue pressing forward. That that character piece that's a struggle, that, that tension point where you know God's wanting you to do something, but you're fighting against it, or, or there's a difficulty there. Paul knows that, that God is, is who's going to give us the strength to get through that. So if you want to grow in godly character, we look to the Bible, we practice endurance, and finally we focus on prayer. As I mentioned in verse five there, he kind of takes a pause and, and starts praying for the, the people in Rome. And he actually does this through his whole chapter. It, kind of at every like, end of any major thought or section or anything like that, he pauses and just prays for them. And, and it, it's short prayers, just saying, hey, I, I hope God does this in your life. I hope God helps you in this way. Because Paul knew the importance of prayer if we're gonna live out what we take in through God's word. And Martin Luther, um, famous theologian from a long time ago, his books are old and dusty now, so we, we read him and compliment him. But he says this, Martin Luther says, to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. We know the importance of breathing. We know the, the significance that oxygen has in our life. We know that without it, we're nothing. And Martin Luther rightly points out here that if we want to to try to live the Christian life but do that without prayer, it's not going to go anywhere. And so know that if you want to grow in in following Jesus, you're not going to do that without prayer. You're not going to see change in your life without God and without prayer. You're not going to make it through the hard moments without prayer. You're not going to represent Jesus to the world around us without spending time getting to know God in prayer. So as we grow godly character, we look to the Bible, we practice endurance, and we focus on prayer. So tonight, let me ask you, how's your character doing? If if I were to to send someone to your house and copy and imitate everything you do for an entire week, how would you feel about that? What are those those areas of your life that that you would maybe want to change? Because those are the areas that God says, hey, I want to... I want to change that. I want to grow your character to be more like my son, Jesus. It, maybe it's in serving, like we looked at here today. Maybe it's in living in unity and peace, like we saw last week. Maybe it's in living with love and integrity in every situation, like we saw three weeks ago. Or maybe it's in being forgiving and a person that, that's a peacemaker that we saw in chapter 12. Or maybe it's something completely all to, different altogether. But where's that point where God's saying, hey, I want to make you more like my son, Jesus. And what do you need to do to take that next step? Because God's desire for all of us is that we would live a godly life. The way we do that is by following Jesus' example, by imitating Christ instead of imitating the world around us, by putting our focus on Jesus and putting everything in our life on him and letting him be the guide. Our prayer for you is that you would do that and see God change your life. So how will you serve? How will you imitate Christ this week? Let's pray.